Um, good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off any electronic devices so it doesn't interfere with the work of the committee? Um, item one on the agenda is taking business in private. Do we agree to take items four and five in private? Thank you very much. Um, we will now take evidence on the Auditor General's report on the NHS in Scotland 2017, and I welcome Caroline Gardner, Aud Auditor General for Scotland, Claire Sweeney, Associate Director, and Kirsty White, Audit Manager for Audit Scotland. Um, could I invite an opening statement from Caroline Gardner? Thank you, Convener. Today's report is our annual overview of the NHS in Scotland. It looks at how the NHS performed in 2016-17, both financially and against national standards and examines the progress made towards moving towards more health care in the community. It highlights the key issues facing the NHS and a number of areas that need to be addressed urgently to achieve sustainable change. Since the NHS was set up in 1948, both Scotland and its health service have changed significantly. Scotland's population has grown to its highest level ever, life expectancy has improved markedly, and the number of people with complex care needs is increasing. In terms of the NHS, staff numbers have increased along with the range of services provided as technology has improved and demand has grown. There is broad consensus that healthcare can't continue to, provide, to be provided in the same way, but there's no simple solution to the challenges facing the NHS and previous approaches are no longer sufficient. There is a lot of activity underway to achieve the government's vision that everyone should be able to live longer, healthier lives at home, but some crucial building blocks still need to be put in place if healthcare is to be transformed. NHS staff remain committed to providing high quality care and patient satisfaction is at an all time high. But there are warning signs that the NHS's ability to maintain high quality care is under pressure. Patients are waiting longer to be seen. There was a 99% increase in the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks for their first outpatient appointment. Patient complaints have increased by 41% over the last five years and a number of surveys have found that staff are worried about the quality of care they can provide. The challenges facing the NHS continue to intensify. In 2016-17, NHS boards had to make unprecedented savings of almost £390 million to break even, and they are finding it harder to make these savings. Cost pressures are continuing, spending on drugs rose by 7%, backlog maintenance remains high at £887 million, and spending on agency locums increased by 6%. Demand for services also continues to increase and significant health inequalities remain. People living in the most deprived communities are still likely to spend longer in ill, in Ill health and to die younger than people living in the least deprived areas. We found that urgent action is needed in several key areas. The Scottish Government needs to set out how existing and future funding will be used differently to move more health care into the community. Workforce planning needs to improve urgently and staff and the public need to be properly engaged in developing new ways of providing health and social care. Convener, as always, will do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Um, can I turn first to Colin Beattie? Convener. Uh, Auditor General, I think Audit Scotland probably has the best independent view of the N overall NHS of anybody. What I've been seeing recently is NHS chiefs and indeed the government starting to talk about it's not a case of more money and more people anymore because that's an uns unsustainable model and I'm looking at the fact that uh, the share of the Scottish budget spent on, uh, on uh, I guess it's the core health service has gone up from 38% to 43% of the national budget and clearly you know that, that is unsustainable. Would you say that we're at a point where we need a complete re-engineering of the NHS? Um, I think, first of all, you're absolutely right that we can't spend our way out of the challenges facing the NHS now. We're seeing the difficulties of um, continuing to uh, try to meet the targets for access to acute care, for example, getting harder, costs rising, demand increasing. Um, I think what we're also saying in the report is that there is a, a broad consensus, which I share, that the vision for um, delivering healthcare differently in the way that you're hinting at is the right one. We need to make sure that um, 
services in the community and particularly around primary care are able to look after the needs of many more people with complex care conditions, avoid more admissions to hospital and help people to get home more quickly. Um, and we've got the vision there, but what we need is these building blocks around a financial framework, thinking about what workforce is needed to do that and making sure that the capital investment decisions are supporting it rather than um, investing most of our capital resources in acute hospitals. You've... Uh you mentioned about uh, lack of detail in terms of uh, areas like GPs and so on, and that's come up before. I understand, and this is just in the last few days, under the new GP contract, there is provision in that for getting information from GP surgeries. Do you have any more detail on that? You're right that it is covered in the proposals for the new GP contract, which were published this week. I think Claire or Kirsty may be able to give you more detail. Yes, yeah, so some, some of the issues previously have been about a lack of information on parts of the system that are not in the acute hospitals um, and getting better access to patient information. Um, so we have seen improvements uh, in that regard over the last few years, but there clearly is something more that needs to happen around uh, access to information through general practice and through co for community services to get a much more rounded feel for how patients are accessing the system and what needs to change. So there are provisions in the new contract that should help with that. We've talked on quite a number of occasions about lack of data from the National Health Service and it's always been a bit of a, a bit of a juggling act because there's a lot of data being getting collected but maybe not in the right place or in the right form or in a consistent form. Are there indications that we're starting to get better data now? I think there are two areas where that's the case. One, as Claire said, in the new GP contract, there are some specific um, proposals about GP practices providing data on their own staffing and on activity, the, the demand for and the activity numbers of patients they're seeing, which will help to fill that. Um, beyond that, I think, um, as Claire said, the uh, overall information about services provided in the community is not nearly as strong as uh, information about hospital activity. Um, and the review published by Sir Harry Burns this week um, again makes a very good point that healthcare information needs to look at the whole system, not just one part of it, or else you risk skewing attention and resources towards the part you're looking at um, and can't manage or balance the system as a whole. Given where we are with the NHS at the moment, and obviously it's coping, but showing some strains, and we certainly don't want to be in the situation as they've got it south of the border. We need to maintain our NHS here. Are there any quick fixes that can be put in place now? I think there are never quick fixes um, for um, a system as important and as complex as health and social care are. Um, and as we say in the report, there's a lot of activity already going on. I think the three things that we've highlighted are the things that will make the difference um, around a financial framework that makes it clear um, how current funding and potential future funding would be used, better workforce planning, and the committee has heard over the last couple of weeks about the problems in knowing the way in which um, NHS staffing needs to change in future to be able to make this shift into community settings, and then making sure that the capital money that is available is being invested to support that rather than um, investing in more acute care where that's not needed. Just coming back to indicators, because clearly they are key to redesigning the NHS or, or, or effectively making the changes that are needed. And it seems to me that in paragraphs 34, 35 of your report, you're say, you seem to be indicating that probably the NHS itself is producing better indicators, but where it's the community side, where it's primary care, the indicators are, are, are less good, less efficient, maybe just not even there. Uh, to pick up the detail of, of the community, community indicators, I'd like to make the, the broad point, first of all, that I think it's useful to distinguish between indicators and targets. Um, I think there are lots of parts of health and social care that we, we need good information of and we need to be monitoring as auditors, as the committee and as people with an interest in healthcare right across Scotland. I think the danger of turning that into targets is that you, you run the risk of skewing priorities towards those targets. Um, and I think the um, review published by Sir Harry Burns helps to um, move that debate on to what do we want to know and what are the relatively few things we should be setting targets for. Drive the targets. 
Um, I think I, I'd see indicators as things that you're sort of measuring and monitoring and seeing how they're changing and where there are indications of pressure points in the, in the system. Um, and for example, the fact that we know the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks for an outpatient appointment doubled is a good indicator that pressure's building up in the system all the way through. But I think focusing just on that number as a target runs the risk that you're not thinking about what's happening in primary care and in the community that actually would have a longer a longer term effect on the number of people waiting to be seen in hospital. So I draw that distinction. Claire, can you pick up your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we know a lot about what is happening in terms of our acute hospital system, particularly in terms of how long people wait um, for certain individual parts of the system. What we are much less good at is understanding how that is interrelated uh, and the connections between different parts of the system, which is why in the report we say there, there is no simple solution to some of the challenges that are facing the NHS. Uh, it's a very complicated system. It's interrelated to things like social care services. Um, the way that GPs work increasingly is thinking about things that aren't just necessarily related to the health system itself. Um, so if there we're talking about things like social prescribing, the, the access to green space, the exercise, things that really can make a difference to improve people's well-being and long-term mental health. So we're very well sided on the acute system in terms of waiting times, less so in terms of the rest of the system. Uh, we're also interested in the extent to which the, the Harry Burns review will lead to a review to help us focus more around outcomes, the impact that the services actually make on people. We also make the, the point in the report that we know far less about quality. So lots of what we're talking about are throughput measures. It's not about the quality of the system that's provided, the care that's provided to people, and we would like to see more around that too. Looking at uh, some of the statistics, the increase in people uh, attending as outpatients, for example, has gone up 12% between the first quarter of 2013 and the first quarter of 2017. That's in paragraph 33. I mean, these are, these are very, very big increases. Is there any indication of it levelling out? Um, if we carry on as we are, all the indications are that it won't level out. If you look at Exhibit 6, we show um, indicators of demand for NHS, NHS services going back to 2012-13, so across a five- or six-year period, um, and all of the indicators for emergency admissions, numbers of procedures, outpatients, number of people waiting for inpatient and day case treatments and GP consultations are going up by different amounts. And we know that to a large extent that's driven by um, an ageing population where more people have got complex care needs, um, and by the fact that for many of those people, although they could be cared for in their own homes, um, and often better if we had a good primary care um, system around them, at, at the moment of need, there often is no alternative but an admission or a referral to hospital. That's absolutely what the vision for healthcare is, is founded on. Um, it's what the GP contract proposals that were published this week is trying to build capacity for. Um, and I think our message is that the urgency of building that capacity and being able to see what effect it's having is the only realistic way of, of dealing with these continuing increases. There must be a projection that shows that at some point the demographics turn, because we've got this bulge of older people, and uh, yes, they need more, more services, but that's going to reduce in the future. So we should start to see a down curve? At some point, yes, um, but the, I was looking at statistics yesterday for um, a speech I'm giving tomorrow, and the latest projections are that by 2030, the number of people over 65 will increase by 50%. Um, and if you plug those numbers into what we've seen over the last five years, it starts to look unsustainable. I think that's why this general consensus about the vision for, for the future to deal with that need, and also because what many of us want as we're getting older and, and have got a, a wider range of needs rather than something that is easily fixed, like um, needing a knee replacement, we'd much much prefer to be in our own homes, but we can only do that if we're really building this strength and depth of capacity in, in primary care. Okay. Alex Neal. Can I uh, begin um, just by asking about the waiting times, because obviously with Harry Buns' report, which is a, seems to me a very good report, um, it raises a whole host of issues. Um, one of the issues I don't think we've ever properly addressed is just the cost of implementing and trying, trying to reach some of these targets, particularly on waiting times, and the extent to which it possibly distorts uh, decisions 
on other matters clinically. Um, have you any sense, you know, if, if supposing we suspended the waiting time targets, uh, the, the ones in statute, um, for a year, what impact do you think that would have um, in terms of the performance and finance and a better allocation of resources within the health service? We haven't attempted to um, estimate the impact in exactly those terms, but 18 months ago we published a report on changing models of health and social care which aimed to get under the skin of um, what's happening with demand and what the successful responses to it look like. Um, and the, the main message coming out of that was that there is a real risk in looking at one part of the health and social care system. If you've got people working to um, not just a four-hour A&E time, but a 12-week um, um, uh, target for uh, inpatient or hospital care um, and a, a reducing target for um, discharging people safely from hospital after their treatment without looking at what's happening in the community. You run the risk of building up pressures elsewhere that can't be um, dealt with. So, for example, we're seeing the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks for their outpatient treatment doubling over the last year. That's signs of pressure building up elsewhere. We don't know how many people are having to wait longer for a GP appointment because we don't collect that information routinely. But there's a real risk that, that by focusing on this bit of the system, you've got pressures building up elsewhere that you're, you're not aware of and that are potentially having a more significant impact on people's health and well-being than getting right the, the treatment time guarantee or whatever other indicator yeah. of the acute system you're focusing on. I mean, on. the A&E targets were, were demonstrated that. The A&E targets were actually driven by the clinicians um, in that case, um, the four-hour target was driven by them. It wasn't a, a political invention if you look back to it. And even if you ask emergency consultants today, they will say that the four-hour target is absolutely the right thing to do. The problem was that nobody was looking, when that policy was introduced 20 years ago, nobody looked at the impact uh, and how it related to the flow of patients through a hospital sector. And a lot of the problems in achieving the target were related to the lack of flow um, of patients through the, the wards in the, in the hospital. I mean, basically, as I read Harry Burns' report, what he's suggesting, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, does this e equate to basically what you're suggesting, and that is we need a, a basically a new performance and impact measurement framework um, that looks at the totality of the patient pathway. and the relationship between the different sectors, primary, acute, uh, and so on. Uh, is, that, is that basically what you're suggesting? I think it's what we say in this report and have been saying for a while. Um, I need to be careful because I'm precluded from commenting on the merits of policy, so I can't talk specifically about targets, but we have been saying that um, the, there is a risk to looking simply at the acute sector, and you need to pull that focus back to understand all of the things around health and social care that are leading to somebody arriving at A&E. But, but, but at the moment, we're not doing that. We, we tend to look at it in silos, in chunks, rather than the relationship between the different parts. And secondly, we tend to look entirely at performance against stated targets rather than impacts. And I think the point that Claire was making is that impacts are at least as important as performance. Uh, and also, if you look at impacts, it dis a differentiates between what the health service can do and what outs external factors over which the health service has no control. So what we want to know is what is the added value of the health service and is it maximising added value? And we don't have a framework, performance and impact monitoring framework that does that. Is that a fair comment? I think that's right. Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, we're, we're focused very much uh, inevitably on the work of the territorial boards and within that the GP sector and the acute sector uh, and, and we would include the Jubilee for the purposes of this discussion in that but um, there are seven other special boards because uh, obviously the, the Jubilee is a special board so there are seven other boards but they play to different extents an important role the ambulance board, the NHS 22, 2024 board NSS and so on and so forth in looking at the financials, um, are, are we getting value for money in your view out of those seven boards? Um, 
You're absolutely right. They play a very significant role or potentially play a very significant role in addressing some of these challenges. Um, and I'll ask Claire to pick up some of that in a moment. Um, we have seen, though, I think, that because of the overall financial pressure on the NHS, the territorial boards having their funding protected in, in real terms in a way that hasn't been the case for the specialist boards. They've tended to see significant real terms decreases in their budgets over a period for very understandable reasons. Um, and I think that that does suggest that they're playing their part in value for money. For me, the question is probably more about whether they're able to play the full, to fulfil their potential to really start to change some of this. So we've seen NHS 24 gradually moving to a point where it can help with um, redirecting patients who don't need to go to A&E into other forms of service. We're seeing NHS Education Scotland thinking about new professional roles, and I think there's probably much more potential there to be playing their part to make the system as a whole more effective. Claire, do you want to? Uh, just to build on that, if you look at Appendix 2, which sets out all of the, the, the territorial and the national boards, you'll see from the national boards listed at the bottom the, the very wide range of different services and support that they can offer. Um, so some of the examples we, we, we've pulled out in previous reports are things like um, the role of the Scottish Ambulance Service in um, responding to patients' need in very urgent situations, and we've seen some really excellent examples of how that has helped to reduce pressure on other bits of the health and care system, um, right through to the role of NSS, to Healthcare Improvement Scotland, to help drive the improvement agenda across health and social care services. So all providing really important services that can help to, to achieve the goal, which is about making care better for people in Scotland. Um, as Caroline says, it's the extent to which they're able to fulfil that to its full potential, given the context that they're working in. And as we see in the report, that, that sense of a need for a, a longer term horizon, um, a move away from focusing on individual bits of the system and a short term focus, uh, a longer term planning horizon, longer term financial planning will really help those boards to, to make the maximum impact. And in terms of the new regional structure, would it, has the time come to maybe, with at least some of those functions, devolve those to the regions rather than have them run at a national level? So I think there, there is a conversation to be had about that, absolutely, as part of, of part of regional planning. Uh, we're very interested in the extent to which the planning arrangements for health and social care across Scotland will work in future. And you'll see that we've had, we, there are exhibits at the beginning of this report that start to draw out how we think that will work in practice. There is a need for more thinking about how the connections will be made from a regional focus on planning uh, through to some of the, the focus of the territorial board all the way through to integration authorities and the role of general practice and localities. So there's a little bit more work to do to think about how all of that connects up so resources are used most effectively. Uh, we've tried to be as clear as we can at the start of the report, making the point that there's, there's need for more thinking there. Just on the data issue, in looking at the GP contract draft that's out to consultation with GPs, I mean, clearly, uh, in previous ed evidence, you've rightly indicated that one of the problems in trying to uh, look at the primary care sector is the absence of data, uh, particularly from GPs and GP surgeries. In looking at the draft contract, um, are you satisfied that that kind of black holes going to be filled? Go on, Kirsty. Okay. Um, we say in the, we raise the, the, the issue in the report that in terms of the new primary care data around GPs that's being developed, the SPIRE system, we raised an issue that there was a potential that GPs wouldn't have to provide that information to local IGBs because they're independent contractors. I understand in the new GP contract that they will have to provide that data either through the SPIRE system or through their own system. So that will certainly help IGBs help with their planning, fill those data gaps that are there, help them do their, their when they work out their local what their local needs are, what their services need to look like. So certainly the new GP contract proposes that that, that should help fill some of those gaps. Fill some of them, but should we not be trying to fill all of them? This is an opportunity which won't arise for at least another five years. So I, I 
I'll uh, start by saying that there, we have seen progress around this over the last few years, um, certainly with the introduction of um, integration authorities. There is a lot more targeted support um, from some of the national boards to try and help focus attention at a local level on what the data tells you. Um, so, for example, um, a focus on things like the number of people who make very intensive use of health and social care services. Um, so they're responsible for um, accessing lots of different services across the system, acute services, right through to general practice. Um, it's really important that there's a focus on how they're using services to help start to um, make sure that they get the care they need as early as possible in the right place so they're not then bounced around the system to different bits. So we have definitely seen improvements around the data that's available. One of the consistent messages from us over the last few years has, a bit, has been about uh, gaps in terms of understanding um, provision in community and primary care services, so not really understanding enough about uh, the numbers of GPs that are there, the way that they work, the services that they can provide, and certainly the new contract starts to make some progress towards a better understanding of that. And my final question is, um, the improvement service does uh, a fine job in identifying improvements in best practice, was my experience as a health secretary. But then, you know, very often that's where it stops. It, uh, you know, you might get, um, they pick up a good practice. For example, there was a computer pen used by community nurses in the Western Isles developed locally in, on their own initiative. Um, and that still hasn't, that was about 10 years ago now, or eight years ago, still hasn't been rolled out as a very good example. So this lack of spread of good practice, lack of drive from the centre to uh, basically ensure that good practice is adopted reasonably quickly um, across the board is, now I know it's a frustration for a lot of people working in the health service. Um, and we hear, you know, we got a lot of anecdotal stuff last week from the chief executive about what might happen in Cowden Beath. Well, that's fine, but why is it not, if it's good practice, now happening across the whole of Scotland? One of the things we say in the report um, as we pull together the action that we think is needed is the um, tightening of the governance arrangements for the change that's required, given its scale and complexity. Um, now, I think we, we'd all recognise that in a system as complex and as people-centred as the NHS, a sort of top-down direction isn't likely to be successful. I think the approach has been very much about letting people develop good practice locally and hope it will spread. We now know it isn't spreading, as you say, as quickly as it needs to. Um, so I've recommended in the report that we need to look again at that governance and maybe think about some of the approaches that have been used for the patient uh, safety program for the early years collaborative about really building that sense of understanding locally across Scotland about why change is needed, what change might look like here and how we'll know it's happening. Claire, you might want to add to that. I think that there's also another dimension, and we've made a lot of this at the end of the report, uh, that not, not only does staff working across the NHS system need to be bought in to understand, to truly live the values and make those changes, but there's also a, a, another key aspect to it, which is it, the, the involvement of patients and the public in Scotland. Uh, so we've said a lot in the report about the need for more transparency, um, about the need for more clarity, about about the services that are provided, the quality of them, and, and true engagement with the public about how the services are delivered in future, because there are difficult decisions that need to be made, um, and we do see some examples where that has been done very well, um, but we think there is scope to improve how the health service engages with the public around some of the difficult decisions that need to be made in future. Thank you. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, so I'd like to look at, uh, you give some key messages I, early in the report at page 11 I, and what you say and I'm quoting from this is the majority of key national performance targets were not met in 2016-17 and wider indicators of quality suggest the NHS is beginning to struggle to maintain quality of care that is then drilled into at paragraph 40 where you give examples of where the various pressures that you've isolated uh, may impact on the quality of care. So my question is, is it clear to anyone exactly why those pressures have arisen uh, in, and in, in terms of the cause and effect? And assuming so, how do the health boards 
intend to respond precisely to those pressures? Um, the circumstances will be different in different parts of Scotland, but across the country we know that we do have a population that's ageing fast. Many of us are living longer, which is a good thing, um, but age tends to bring with it complex um, health conditions, complex care needs um, that aren't easily fixed by one admission to hospital, um, as, as is often the case when we're lucky enough to be younger. So we've got the ageing population playing in, and we've also got the fact that healthcare costs tend to rise more quickly than general inflation. So although the government has been committed to um, maintaining the health budget in real terms, um, we know that uh, drug costs last year rose by 7% against general inflation at or three percent and it, drugs are one example but that happens um, more widely because of the innovations in health technology that's available so the two of those together i think are behind um, the recognition that we have in the report and that's shared more widely that we can't just spend our way out of this and it's not just just a matter of being more efficient in what we currently do um, health policy over the last few years, um, in terms of what's uh, visible in the public domain, has tended to be about the targets that you've drawn attention to, about how long people are waiting for um, acute care, for admission to hospital, for treatment. Um, but actually, the only way of um, speeding up that part of the system is by taking away some of the pressures of people who could be treated better if there was a good primary care team near their home who could stop them being admitted um, in an emergency uh, by treating their chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary, pulmonary disease better, um, by helping them to recognise when their, their health is deteriorating to take action to respond to it, rather than them ending up in A&E on a Saturday evening because those signs have been missed. So I think the point of our report is to try and focus attention back on that end of the system to capitalise on things like the proposals for the new GP contract and the review of targets and think about how we can see the system as a whole rather than just that one dimension of it. <coughs> that makes sense, of course. Uh, I wonder, though, is do you get any sense that the individual boards, because you, you say there's, there's a kind of macro picture, but then there's also the more micro picture where each individual has its own individual pressures. Did you get any sense that the individual boards understand the individual pressures pertaining to them and they have the bespoke plan to deal with that? I think it varies. Claire, do you want to pick that up? It does vary. Um, we, the, we see in the report there are a number of big issues affecting the NHS in Scotland that are common across all. Um, so some of the things that would be included in that list are difficulties in recruiting and retaining in certain specialties. Um, that's something that is widely recognised as a, as a national issue. Um, there are also similar issues around the social care sector, which again has an absolute knock-on effect in terms of, uh, of health. So there are many, many things affecting the system that are common across Scotland. Uh, and we, we would go further than that. These are Many of these issues are affecting health systems across the world. Uh, so this is not unique to Scotland. Scotland. Um, of course, there are particular issues affecting individual boards, uh, and they will be aware of those. Um, that might be um, difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff in health and social care in the central belt, where there are many other employment opportunities for people. Um, so particular pressures in the island boards, for example, of recruiting and retaining GPs. Uh, but generally speaking, yes, there are there are consistent issues across Scotland that need to be addressed, some, some very local specific areas, uh, but in the main these are, these are broad uh, issues affecting the system across, across, across the nation. Can I just ask, this wasn't where I was going to go, but uh, you, you raise the point that uh, these are not unique issues to the NHS in Scotland or the NHS in the UK, uh, and you say it's across the world, uh, which begs the question, has anyone successfully solved these sorts of issues across the world? And if so, what are we learning from them? Well, I've opened a can of worms, haven't I? Um, so uh, there, there are some very good examples of individual bits of practice that are starting to change the way health systems operate. Um, so some very good examples from, from the rest of the world in terms of access to things like primary and community care services. Um, 
they fit with the general shift in Scotland about a focus on providing care closer to people's homes, about um, supporting and enabling um, practitioners to make more independent decisions about care, um, to put the person at the heart of the treatment that they receive. So there are a number of really good examples across the world. Uh, and Scotland is trying to learn from those examples. Um, I think the issue we would highlight is, well, how do you so find there are pockets of examples and some really innovative practices starting to be taken forward but what's needed in terms of the financial picture is more of a plan more of a financial framework as we we call it in the report to give us a sense of how we're going to get from here and now to this ambitious view of the world uh, as it will look in a few years time we need something to bridge the gap between the two so yes e examples of where some systems have started to overcome some of those challenges but they are incredibly complex and difficult yeah, i'd like to focus on that financial aspect, and Colin Beattie quite rightly raised the issue of savings. Uh, <clears throat> and obviously it's very difficult for the boards to make particular savings. And uh, you especially comment in your report that NHS boards' use of non-recurring savings is unsustainable. Uh, and just to delve into that, you explained that the non-recurring savings accounted for 30% of all the planned savings in 2016-17, more than double the, the level of five years ago. Now, it seems to me, first of all, that it cannot be sustainable to continually pair uh, a service. So that begs the question, how concerned are the boards themselves with the current approach to savings? And secondly, have they proactively suggested alternatives to the current programme of non-recurring savings that they're going through. Kirsty, do you want to pick that one up? Yes, it's a very good point. We've said for a number of years the level of non-recurring savings is, 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 is unsustainable. Every year the boards manage to generally make their savings. This year they didn't, they didn't meet the, the target they'd set themselves. In terms of the actual non-recurring in 1617, it was just over a third, at 35% of, of all the savings made were non-recurring. What's interesting as well is that the level of unidentified savings is also increasing over the past, past few years. So in um, 1617, it ranged from Shetland, they knew where all their savings were coming from, um, up to a third at, at NHS Fife, so 33% of their savings at the start of the year, they didn't know where those savings would be coming from. Alongside that, we're seeing an increase in, in the level of risk attached to those savings, so boards know that a number of their savings are high risk. Some of that will be related to... Sorry. Forgive me interrupting, I just it didn't quite follow that point. So, are you suggesting that at the start of the year, um, the NHS board will say, we intend to save X amount by this time next year. And when you say, I can't remember the phrase you used, but the, the, the unidentified savings, uh, that, that is they're saying we're going to save X amount, one third of it, I think you said, we don't actually know where that's going to come from, we're just going to save it. Is that correct? Did I read you right? Yes, so the 33% the was, was particular to five. Um, in terms of 16-17, it was 17% at a national level. So yes, in their LDPs, boards set out, they agree with the government, we will make X amount of savings. They will then try and identify those savings. But what we've seen over the past few years is an increasing trend towards the boards don't know where those savings are coming from. Where they do know where the savings are coming from, the savings are increasingly high risk. A lot of this is attached to things like closures of facilities where they may identify at the start of the year we would like to close X facility, but actually, as the year goes on, public political pressure means it becomes very difficult to do so. And then the final question that arises from that is, do the boards both project the impact of those savings on patient care, and do they then retrospectively assess the impact of those savings on patient care and indeed the staff, particularly if at the start of the year they didn't know what those savings were going to be? The boards should assess savings for clinical impact. So they, they should be before the, the information goes to their own boards and they make those decisions around savings. The boards should be identifying exactly what impact those savings will have on, on, on the clinical element and then the link onto patients. I'm not 
aware that boards then retrospectively look at the impact. Obviously, some of that impact will come through in terms of impact on, on say, existing performance indicators. They may see drop-offs or, or, or improvements in some of that. I'd be happy to come back to the, the, the committee with more information on that. I think that would be useful, because uh, just one thing that arises is uh, if, if they are assessing the impact of proposed savings, if the board sits and says, OK, we, we intend to do X, uh, that we think will save Y, uh, and then we assess what the impact is going to be. Do they at any point, have you seen any evidence of them saying, this impact could be considerable, let's not do this, let's find another way to make the savings? Is there evidence of that? I'm just going to say that they, you'll see from the way we've described the savings picture at pages 15 and 16 um, about the differences in savings. We're able to see something of the trends in recurring, non-recurring savings over the last year. Um, but you'll notice at paragraph 26 that we've drawn out that there, there are differences in terms of how savings are reported and that, that message changes throughout the year. We're very interested in... Um, whether there's scope to make that much clearer, not just in terms of planning the services and understanding the, the way that the resources are being used, that's important, but also what that says to the public. So is there clarity about how the savings agenda is being planned for throughout the year? Is it being done in a meaningful way to try and improve efficiencies, to try and get to this aspiration of how services will operate? And we think, and we've made a recommendation, that there's scope to get much sharper at how the savings issue is being dealt with. So whilst that doesn't speak to the, the detailed point you're raising, I think it's the, that, that shows the context we're working with here, that there is scope to be sharper around the reporting of savings. That's very useful. Thank you. Colin. Very briefly, convener. We know that boards take um, the issue of savings very seriously, and that's why some of them do fail to meet the level of savings they've planned, because they're not prepared to put patient care, patient safety at risk. One of the things that drives the way of planning that kirsty has been describing is the need for them to break even every year. Um, and one of our recommendations here, again, has been to um, give boards a longer-term financial planning framework so that they can be thinking about how they invest to save and how they make changes in a way which aren't just about cutting at the margins uh, as we've seen, that's reaching the end of its usefulness. Thank you, Convener. Colin Beattie had a supplementary. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, Liam Kerr uh, referred to paragraph 40 and uh, the overall pressures and so on on the health service. Why is it that we've got all this doom and gloom out there as to what's built up and the pressures on the health service? And in paragraph 39, you say that inpatient satisfaction is at an all-time high. Patient safety indicators are continuing to improve, and the Nuffield Trust 2017 report said there's a strong culture of continued improvement or continuous improvement. It, it, it seems a bit of a conflict there. I think it reflects, um, in part, the great efforts that staff go to to continue delivering um, high-quality care for patients, and perhaps the fact that, pa that patients recognise that. We all are exposed every day to concerns about the effects of austerity on public services, and I think patients know that staff are working very hard to maintain care. We've also seen the government making very significant commitments and investment in the patient safety programme, and we've seen some real results from that in terms of things like the rates of hospital or healthcare acquired infection, um, which are very positive. But across the page, we also highlight some evidence that's going in the other way. We see patient complaints increasing. We see, see staff responding to surveys with concerns about the time they have available for delivering the quality of care that they want to. So I, I absolutely want to recognise um, the huge commitment of staff in continuing to provide the best care they can. And I think we need to put that in the context of other signs that it's getting more difficult for them to do that. OK. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could just pick up on the point about targets and meeting targets that was made earlier. See, if you look, Auditor General, at Appendix 3, there's a whole series of tables there um, showing how the various boards have met all the various performance targets and I'm looking particularly at the 12 week treatment target. Only one board met that particular target so you, your impression of that is this is disastrously bad and there's something far wrong but what's the impact of demand on these performance figures? If, if they're simply raw figures about meeting a 12 week target how do we know what the impact of demand is 
in the various communities that might be pushing these numbers down? Um, it's a really good question, and I think it goes back to the questions that Mr Neil was asking earlier um, about uh, the effect of targets on the system as a whole. Um, first of all, um, we have said before that there's, there's no evidence to show us that these targets were set with an understanding of the capacity of the system to manage flow through them. And our report last March, March 2016, tried to set out some of the modelling that suggests it's going to get harder and harder to meet these targets because of imbalances in the system across the piece. Hospitals, I think, are getting much better at managing the flow through their hospital, um, and um, the uh, four-hour A&E waiting time target has been a driver for that because they've had to um, manage as actively as possible patients going on to the right place quickly to do it, um, but they can't manage the things which are outside the hospital system. So. They can't um, easily at the moment manage the number of patients who arrive in A&E who actually could be better looked after in many cases in primary care if the capacity were available there. And they can't directly manage the number of patients who are, who are medically fit to be discharged but can't safely be discharged because social care isn't um, readily available to, to make that transition safely. So um, I think that's a really good um, example that you've pointed to of why just focusing on the acute service and access to it, um, A, doesn't give the whole picture, and B, runs the risk of um, simply speeding up and speeding up to the point where the system can't cope because the real drivers are outside. Do, do you think we need to think and do something about that to show the impact of demand they've got on these targets? Not, not to conceal bad performance where it may be, but to give a more accurate reflection of the performance of the service that's actually going on. Because if, if you look at that table again, you, poor Fourth Valley is at 63.5%, you might think, what on earth is going on there? But perhaps they're performing really well and they've had a doubling in demand. We, we, we don't know that. Should we try to reflect some of this within the stats that we produce from, from year to year? I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. I think also on, on page 20 and 21, we've tried to draw out the, the how demand is interacting with what's happening around the waiting lists. So this sense of waiting lists just getting larger and larger and larger. But actually, when we looked, it's not always that, that more people are, being, are getting treatment. Um, so there is something about that and starting to see the effect of potentially um, being very difficult to fill vacancies, that the fact that the system's been driven so fast, it's very hard for it to continue to improve in that way. Um, and so there is a need for a more understanding about what's really happening because of those waiting times figures. And that's absolutely true. And that's when we will start to see some differences across the boards. I don't know if there's anything else to... Just to add to that, one of the points we make in the report is the need for, for better and more information around some of this area. So some of that relates to actually the, the length of waiting times for, for patients, um, the, type, the number of GP referrals coming in, coming back to that point about the need for data around the primary care element and what's driving that pressure into the acute system. So, for example, NHS Grampian in the past year, they started writing to patients saying, you've been referred for treatment. This is, you know, these are the amounts of people waiting. This is your likely length of time that's happened just to be, try and be more transparent about actually what are the pressures around the system we're facing. And, and see, um, stick, stick with the same column, thinking beyond the target, do we collect, does anyone collect data on when people were actually seen? And what I mean by that is, if, say, say, for example, Fourth Valley, again, 63.5% were seen within 12 weeks. When did they reach 100%? Is it, is it a week later or is it months later? Is there a clinical impact on those people and all of these targets who are out with the target time? And what's the, the clinical impact of that, if there is any? Individual health boards and hospitals are do have that data and are using it actively. Um, and um, I guess it, it's another example of where having the data and the indicators is more useful than having targets. If you've, if you've got um, a target which says that 100% um, of people referred to outpatients need to be seen within 12 weeks, you're going to try and drive everybody through that 12 weeks because that's what the target says. Um, and we've seen that's getting harder and harder to do. The number of people waiting more than 12 weeks doubled last year. If you're looking at it in a more nuanced way, you can say that actually we're still managing to see everybody within 16 weeks. And while we manage the pressure 
in uh, GP practices and in the um, inpatient or day case treatment, that's, that's acceptable for us for now and we'll work on the system as a whole. Or alternatively, we've got some people who are actually waiting 26 weeks or a year and that's not acceptable, so we'll focus on those specialties. So it helps you understand what's going on and really manage the system in a way which is much likely to lead to better outpatients um, for our treatment outcomes for patients than a, 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 a target which says 100% should be seen within, within a particular point of time. It, it's quite a sort of nuanced thing, but I think that difference between measuring it and having a target is a really important one in being able to manage the system and get the best outcomes for as many patients as possible. Okay. And, and, and just, just to build on that slightly, um, we have looked at this in some detail for certain bits of the system in, in the last few years, so we carried out some work looking at um, accident and emergency emergency services and it was very interesting looking at the, the the time if we looked at it kind of set the clock from people going into a &E and looked at when they were receiving treatment up to the four hour and beyond um, and what was really interesting was it was for, it was quite difficult to do to do that but it was quite illuminating in in seeing you know were patients waiting longer in some instances because they were being treated just before they tripped into the four hours so there are all sorts of issues that um frontline staff are dealing with in terms of being able to treat the right people at the right time in terms of clinical priority and need but also with a, with an absolute eye to these targets and that's why it can it can really have an effect on the way that people are experiencing the health system okay could, could i turn to your your main recommendations in the report or as general you, you clearly talk about things like better financial planning capital investment workforce planning governance transparency i mean these are these issues are not uncommon we've, we've heard many of these before what's your sense of having made these and making these recommendations that you as the uh, auditor general will be able to follow up on progress with these and do you see the nhs various departments for delivering this service do you see us being able to structure ourselves in terms of making real positive gains and delivering on those key recommendations and how how will we know will we will be sitting together next year saying the same things or are you confident that our structures and, and management processes in place that will begin to deliver on these um i'm i'm more hopeful than i have been um i was looking back at the report we published in march 2016 um where we talked about the need for stronger national leadership to deliver the vision um and i think since then we have seen big um progress on the uh proposals for the new GP contract. Um, we've seen the review of uh, targets and indicators coming through. Um, we've seen some of the things you heard about workforce planning really starting to, to gather pace. Um, so, so we say in the report there is a lot of activity happening. Um, I think the things which we set out, there's two or three key recommendations about the financial framework, the workforce planning and the capital investment strategy can help to bring that together. Um, along with the sort of um, forward look in terms of demand and responses to it that the committee has been exploring over the last few weeks. I think, I think the, lots of the building blocks are there. These recommendations will help to really bring those together and make sure that everybody is moving in the same direction and that it's possible to measure progress and to respond where progress isn't happening as fast as it needs to. Presumably you'll be, you will be following up on the Be here again next year, board. yes. <laughs> I, could, I wonder if I could ask you a question about something you said in paragraph 45. You're telling the committee about you know, particular areas of deprivation and the gap is not closing healthcare issues and areas of multiple deprivation, the gap's not closing and in some areas is widening. Have you made any particular recommendations to try to assist government to, and the NHS to, to begin to close this gap? Um, I think it, it operates at two levels. One is what the health service can do and one is what society, public service as a whole need to do. Claire, I know you'll want to pick that one up. Yes, we um, produced a report a couple of years ago on health inequalities um, and as part of that work we were asking questions about not just um, universal provision of services and everybody's expectations that they would receive the same level of care, but to understand what efforts were being made to try and address the, the, the gap, to address the needs of people who 
perhaps found it really hard for whatever reason to engage with their GP or to get into the system in terms of things like screening. Um, and we've made, made a series of recommendations in that report to try and help the service to focus in on addressing the gap. It's not just enough to provide the same to everybody. There are some parts of society where people need just a little bit extra support to get into the, the services that they, they need and probably actually they need more than some other people in society. So it's, it's that extra work that goes in to try and help support people into the system. And there are good examples across Scotland, but we absolutely saw through that piece of work that there was a need to do more. Yeah, last question, Jackie. Um, it's on telehealth. Um, do you see an increasing role for telehealth in shaping the whole service delivery for the NHS? And wh where do you see it making a, its greatest impact? Um, I think it has got huge potential um, and we see some really good um, examples of that. The Attend Anywhere pilot that's happening in Grampian, I think is a very good example of it. Um, I'd also, though, um, echo what the Chief Medical Officer said last week in evidence to you, that we shouldn't underestimate the very straightforward technology that everybody's got, like the telephone. You've heard examples of GPs using the phone to be able to make early contact with people, to, to understand what their problem really is, to either bring them in quickly if that's needed, or to point them towards somebody else if that's a better response. I think we can think in much more flexible ways about the way the health service as a whole responds. Technology makes that more possible, but we don't need to wait for the magic technology to come along. And do you think it's consistent enough? I think Alec Neil mentioned that, but good practice exists in pockets. How do we make sure that good practice, for example, in areas like telehealth is spread right across? I'm sure it's not consistent enough at the moment. Um, again, I think there are some pointers in the proposals for the new GP contract that help with that. Um, and um, the recommendation we've made about stronger governance of this to be clear about what's expected of people and how we know whether that's happening or not is also an important part of it. Thank you very much. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. i um, just going to flick back to your recommendation page. I think the one that hasn't been mentioned, and it's at the back of the report, but it's, it's still important, is on... Um, and I've lost my page completely now. But it's basically about everyone sort of working together, and uh, I think that's the part that we're still not seeing real evidence of. So if I can go to paragraph... 87. Um, I think it is interesting to to note that you know what you see in your report is although public health has traditionally been seen as the business of of the NHS, as little as 10% of the population's health and well-being is linked to access to healthcare. So a lot of what we're talking about today is actually you know it's not for the NHS alone to sort out. Um, you're talking about the need for a, a shared commitment across the public sector and, and perhaps beyond. Um, what, where is the evidence that there is that shared commitment and that people understand this need to work differently and to work together? I'll kick off by saying it's at the end of the report because we think it is very important, not because we think it's not. And I'll ask Claire to pick up what we see the state of play as yeah. being. We, um, we mentioned in the report the introduction of the integration of health and social care being part of the key here. Uh, we're going to carry out more work. Um, we're just starting that work now. We'll be reporting next year around the, the progress that's being made with integration and some of the challenges that we're already seeing coming through. But they do represent an opportunity for an integrated approach beyond just the health and social care system to think about the needs of the local population. And as I mentioned earlier, that might be you know access to green space, it might be about um, making sure that people have, have, uh, that that children are, are eating healthily, that everything is being done to help them succeed in schools and and find work after 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 education. Um, so I think it, there is an opportunity through the integration of health and social care to think much more broadly, and we're starting to see some really good examples of that happening. Uh, but it is challenging. One of the other messages in this report is about the the, the long term nature of a lot of the things we're talking about today. Uh, that there is no quick and easy fix, that some of this takes an awful long time, uh, that we need to have the right measures in place, the right workforce in place, that we need to have an open conversation with the public about what's possible. Um, there's also an onus on the public in terms of their own health, and we're starting to see conversations about that happening across Scotland now, which is really encouraging. So some green shoots that things are starting to move forward, and there is a mechanism through which that should be a little bit easier in future, but we're yet to report on that. Okay. I mean, health and social care, the, the integrated joint boards, they still operate at quite a high level. So what I'm thinking about as we're listening to evidence today is 
you know, you've got people working in housing departments and roads departments and planning departments, people who uh, deal with leisure centres. You know, how many of those people do you think are, have a focus on, on what we're talking about today and think that they have a part to play in that? Because, you know, there's working groups, there's other things being set up, but day to day there's thousands of people, you know, across the public sector and in other sectors who have a, a role to play. Um, are people sitting back waiting to get some direction from the top? How do we get this working sort of from a, a bottom-up approach? So without um, predicting what that report might say, because we've yet to do the work, um, we know that it's been recognised that housing, the example you, you gave there, is absolutely vital to this work. And so we have produced some work in the past that's talked about the role of housing in the context of, of health and wellbeing more broadly. So I, I don't think it would be a surprise that there might be more that needs to happen out there across Scotland, but there are some really good examples where housing is starting to be tied in, but I'm sure that we will find that there is a need to do more around Around that for sure. Um, the opportunity with health and social care integration to have a, a real meaningful conversation with, with local, within local areas about their needs, the services that are working very well, but where there are gaps and where there's an opportunity to do something different for local communities. Mm -hmm. with, with, for example, with the voluntary sector uh, and with the housing sector, it's really important that that's front, front and centre as part of that development, but we will be doing more work that will touch on that and will report next year. Are you seeing any evidence of health impact assessments being carried out um, to look at the, you know, the, the impact of decisions on, on budgets or on policy and strategies? Because for that joined up approach to work, people have to understand the consequences of any decisions that are taken. Is that something that's happening? So we've not looked in detail at that as part of this piece of work. Um, I'm trying to think, there are some particular examples we've seen uh, just in the course of this, we've not included it within the reporting, where there are examples where that's worked, but I'm sure that there's scope to improve that. It's not something we looked at in any great detail as part of this piece of work. Okay. I just want to, I know there's opportunities coming up with like, the planning bill and so on to, to embed that kind of good practice. Um, going back then to, to the NHS, um, Looking at the, the cost pressures in Exhibit 5, um, one of the things that you highlight is that the NHS estate, 70% um, of it was rated to be in good physical condition. There's, there's a slight improvement there, so that's good. But looking at the, the backlog of, of maintenance across NHS boards, it's $887 million. It's, you know It's quite significant. There's a high element of that is classed as significant to high risk. So I just wondered what kind of decisions are boards having to make and if things are being put on the back burner, what are the risks and, and what are the concerns attached to that? So there, there are, um, there's probably a broad point to be made and then I'm, Kirsty will probably want to give some more of the detail around this, but because of the introduction of health and social care integration and a different way of delivering services to meet people's needs, um, we recognise in the report that there is more work to be done around this. So backlog maintenance on existing estate, some of that estate will not be in the right place, will not be the right facility, so there is a need for the planning arrangements to catch up with some of that. So whilst we've got a figure at the moment for maintaining the current estate, we know there's a general recognition that things need to change, services will look different, that's bound to have an impact on the estates and facilities that are there. So there's a little bit more work to do to fully understand that, but I know Kirsty will want to say more about the, the detail. Yes, just to pick up on Claire's point, just that, that point, that, that global sum of £887 million is, is not a sum that all boards and the government will have to find and, and, and spend in the, in the next few years, because as Claire says, the state needs will change and, and boards and the government need to work together to identify how that how the NHS needs to change to make sure it's fit for purpose for for the future. So that's one of the, the recommendations we make around is, is the need for that capital investment strategy. Around the high risk a backlog that exists, boards will identify in their asset management strategies the extent to which the backlog maintenance is high risk. They will then decide the appropriate strategies to, to decide how to deal with that. Some of that may be, OK, we know that actually we're about to open a new hospital, therefore it's fine. If we look at this picture next year, actually the condition will have, will have completely changed. Um, but it's about it, it's board's responsibility to prioritise the capital investment that they have and how they manage their estate and make sure that it is, it is, su is in good condition, it is suitable and it's functional for, for patients. 
And from the work that you've been doing in the audit, are, are boards showing that they've got the, the, sort of the skills and the capacity to do this well? Um, I know your recommendation is to develop a capital investment strategy, but has that been sort of lacking or has it not been adequate so far? Boards have had asset management strategies for a number of years now um, and it's it, the, the, the data that exists around the NHS estate is much better than it used to be. What we're seeing is that there is a need at a national level for, for a strategy to pull together all of those board strategies that exist. Boards will identify on their own where they think that the estate needs to go and the amount of money that needs to go into it, but obviously there's a limited pot of, of capital money at a national level. So the government needs to, to pull that together, work with the boards, the IGBs, to identify where the estate needs to move. That brings in the new elective centres as well, what regional working will look like, the facilities around that, the facilities at a local level around, and say, enhanced GP services, and pull that all together to make sure that the amount of capital money that's available is, is able to deliver the estate that's going to be needed in the future. Okay. And just last point on that, um, in the report you see there's been a 7% increase in backlog maintenance, class is significant and high risk, and that's sitting at 47%. I mean, that does sound quite high. Um, I mean, high risk, what kind of circumstances is that, is that covering? High risk can cover a range of things. Some of it may be the basics of wind and water tight. A lot of it will be to do with safety compliance of, of, of regulations and, and, and how well the facilities are able to, to actually meet the, the, the regulations that, that exist for patient care. And have you got any sense of, you know, what kind of impact this is having on, on staff morale or I know there's been an increase in, in patient complaints. Does it have any sort of connection to, to this? Because I know how people feel in an environment can really affect their 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 their, their well-being and, and their mood as well. So if people feel like this looks like it's falling round about us, that might have a, an impact. Are you getting any sense of that? We didn't have a look at that in, in, in any detail in, in this report, but I do know that the national report on the NHS estate that, that was published in the summer does have an indicator around patient satisfaction with the estate, and actually that's improved slightly over, over the past few years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bill Bowman, do you have a question? Thank you, convener. I was going to ask a question I think Colin Beattie came in on, but I'll ask it anyway in a slightly different way. You, you said that the levels of overall patient satisfaction continue to be high, and but in the same breath, you more or less said complaints were up, and we see in the financial statements that there are hundreds of millions, I think, of pounds set aside for me medical negligence claims. I mean, there's something counterintuitive there. I mean, how robust is the statement that levels of overall patient satisfaction continue to be high? Um, we've taken the statement from um, the National Inpatient Experience Survey, which is a very large, um, robust survey which is carried out on a regular basis. Um, so it, it is what patients are saying in response to questions and in large enough numbers to give it credence. Um, I think in response to a question that perhaps Mr Coffey asked earlier, um, I said we know that that's not necessarily a straightforward thing. We know that patients rate the NHS very highly anyway, and that if they recognise that staff are working harder than ever to provide their care, that may be um, reflected in, in the levels of satisfaction that they're reporting. Um, but for completeness, we've shown the range of different um, indicators of, of quality in the NHS um, and highlighted that they aren't um, consistent in that way. Claire, do you want to add to that at all? I, I, I don't think there's much more to add. I, I'm, I think what we're saying is that we, we understand why those things might look counterintuitive, but actually that, that's the facts as we, as we see them. Um, because people are consciously engaging with clinical staff and feel the care and support that they get is good um, is not necessarily counter to all of the challenges that we know the NHS is facing. I think it does speak to that message right at the start of the report about the commitment and the hard work of, of staff so the, the information is, is valid. Um, it, it, what we see in the report that it's becoming increasingly difficult for staff to continue to provide that level of care. So the, um, the survey only asks a limited number of questions. I don't. I'm not familiar with it. It doesn't sort of look beyond um, that you had a good experience with the frontline person. 
It asks quite a, quite a wide range of questions, I think, um, and we go on to say in the same bullet point that a significant minority of patients did feel that they were less involved in discussions about their care than, than they would like to be. So there's, there's some nuance there, but nonetheless, the headline about overall satisfaction is what people reported in response to the survey. Okay. Um, on another comment you made, I think you said there was no quick fix. No. I don't know what analogy is the, the appropriate one for the NHS, whether it's a super tanker or a convoy. By the time the slow fix comes in, it's somewhere else in different circumstances. I mean, how, do, how do you fix it then, if there are no quick fixes? Um, I, I think, I think um, what I would say is that because, of, because the health service is about people and because we do have very good demographic information and information about some bits of the health service, we can see what's likely to happen over the next 30 years. So the population uh, forecasts give us a very good indication of how much the number of older people is going to increase in that period. Um, we know what's happening to life expectancy and, and we've seen some very significant increases which have reduced slightly. Um, recently we can play all of that in. Um, and there is um, increasingly strong evidence, as Claire was describing, from, from around the world, that moving our focus away from just what's happening in acute hospitals to what happens near people's homes in primary care and in, in the wider public services can address some of this. Um, so um, the, the point that I'm trying to make in the report is that some of the building blocks are in place. We've got the proposals for the new GP contract. We've got the review of the targets and indicators. We've got general um, commitment to the vision what's needed now is those key things to make it happen around a financial framework that makes sure we're investing in the right places, um, better workforce planning that makes sure we've got the people we need doing the, the new jobs and the new types of services that are needed in future, and that we're um, making sure that our capital investment is building an NHS for the future, not just running to keep up with what we've got right now. Um, I, I think... Uh, there are a number of small things that can be done that will help it on the way. I don't think there's a quick fix. Coming back to something um, Liam Kerr asked about, you were talking or mentioned unidentified savings. Is that just the way the boards make their budgets? They just take the difference between what they know and what they don't know and to make it balance and then sort it out later? Um, Kirsty will want to talk you through it, I think, but if you look at the case study on page 19, that gives you an example from an HS Grampian of how they go about it. Um, they're taking, as you would expect, what they think they will have in terms of money to spend, what they think will happen to the commitments they've got for workforce, drugs and other pay pressures, and that gives them a gap they need to close, and they then work, about, work on planning how they will close that gap. Kirsty, do you want to pick that up? Yes, there's not much to add to that, actually, because... Caroline gave a very good e explanation. As case study one shows on page 19, the boards will make assumptions about certain things. They will know certain things. They will make assumptions about certain things, such as funding over, over future years. They will work that all through, look at the funding and the in other income that they are receiving, and then identify where they need to make savings. In terms of then identifying those savings, they will they will basically work through where they think those savings can be made. As I mentioned earlier, it's becoming increasingly difficult for boards to do that. We've seen, obviously, over a number of years, that the slicing element, but but that is not sustainable. And, 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 bo and the reason we've got to a point of quite high levels of unidentified savings is because we're getting to that point of, of service redesign, that things really need to change. There isn't just small amounts that can keep coming off. Okay, thank, and one last yes. point, thank you. I mean, you know, you write very carefully crafted reports. Um, we get very carefully worded replies from, from the government. But in the past um, few sessions, we had three chief executives saying there were, there were no workforce plans, basically. And then we had this um, chief of the NHS coming along saying there were. So if you look through the words, and from what you said, there's a lot of changes to come there's a lot of um, thinking that needs to be done working together. Is the system actually fit for purpose for that? Um, we say in the report that the, the signs of pressure are increasing. Um, I think the sessions you heard over the last two weeks on workforce planning are a subset of the, the, the bigger problem we're describing here. Um, and I think uh, 
the, the recommendations we made in the reports that led to those sessions on workforce planning are what needs to improve there. Um, I, I said in response to an earlier question, I, I think this can be done, but I think it does need, first of all, very concerted effort, and it needs the three key recommendations we're making in this report to be addressed urgently. We've got the building blocks there. There's a huge amount of commitment to make it work. It's about pulling all of that together and making sure that all of that effort is pulling in the same direction on the things that will make the biggest difference. I would say that's a carefully crafted answer, that change needs to come. Okay, and the... Colin Beatty. I just wanted to come back in on one thing about savings. Uh, obviously, the non-recurring savings are a, are a, a worry. Um, you don't give any sort of breakdown, I don't think, on what they might be. One thing that I was concerned about, which has come up in previous reports, is that a proportion of these savings uh, were generated in some boards by delaying filling posts. Now, I know there's a problem in getting people to fill posts, but is there any indication of deliberate delays? Yes, it, that's just one of the measures, that's one of the ways that boards are trying to make those savings. So in the past, not just past year, but previous years as well, there's a range of ways that, that boards are, are, are trying to make the savings around the non-recurring element. Some of it has been that actually they've been delaying filling posts until a few months on, year on, um, just to try and make those savings. Is that? In terms of in terms costs of the non-recurring costs, of course, I don't have the the level of detail with me uh, around that. We didn't we didn't go into that level of detail, but I'd be happy to have a look at it and come back. That'd be good. It'd be very helpful. Alex Neil with a very brief point. A very brief point about complaints uh, and the increase in complaints. To be fair, over the last three or four years, the NHS has introduced the patient opinion system, which was deliberately designed to elicit uh, information about where things were going wrong and so on. So could it be that the rise in complaints is at least partly, if not largely, due to a better system and you know a deliberate attempt to get that kind of feedback? Exactly that in the report. At the top of page 24, we say that um, NH NHS boards have worked to raise awareness of their complaint system, and that may account for at least some of the rising complaints. We can't break it down, but we recognise it may be a factor. I just wanted to get it on the record here yeah. as well. I'll make the observation <laughs> anecdotally um, that actually my constituency casework has increased exponentially, and it's NHS complaints that it's full of. Um, Auditor General and your two colleagues, thank you very much for giving evidence this morning. Um, we'll now have a brief pause to allow witnesses to change <laughs> over. Um, we will now take evidence on the Auditor General's report on NHS Tayside, and I welcome Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Fiona Mitchell Knight, Assistant Director of Audit, and Bruce Crosby, Senior Audit Manager from Audit Scotland. Could I invite an opening statement from Caroline Gardner? Thank you, Convener. 
For the first time in five and a half years in this job, I can't find my speaking note for this morning, so I will make it very short to introduce um, your questions to us. As you know, um, I've reported for the last two years on uh, questions about the financial sustainability of NHS Tayside um, and the action which the board and the Scottish Government are taking uh, to try and uh, return to financial sustainability. Um, the report that you have in front of you is the third of those. Um, it's under my powers under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act, which enable me to bring to the attention of Parliament and this committee issues that have arisen from the audit of the accounts of the board, which I think are of interest to you. Um, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, as the appointed auditor, has given the board an unqualified audit opinion again this year, uh, but she has highlighted that the uh, concerns around financial sustainability continue, um, that there is a lot of action going on within the board itself to try and um, return to financial sustainability. Um, they made a significant amount of efficiency savings in 2016-17, but still required an additional um, four million pounds in brokerage last year, and the savings were still below the target they had set themselves. Um, as you know, the Scottish Government has appointed um, an assurance group to work alongside the board to provide assurance about the quality of the work it's doing uh, to change the way it works and bring itself back into balance. The latest report of that group um, has recognised the extent of the work that's going on and the extent to which it focuses on the right areas, but al has also highlighted that the next period will be critical in moving from developing plans to actually implementing those plans. Um, and we will be continuing to work alongside the group as part of our audit work to understand what that means. Um, Fiona and uh, Bruce Crosby from the audit team are here to help me answer questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Um, Alex Neil. Yeah, hey, can I uh, just try to clear up the the debt and the brokerage issue? Because there seems to be still some confusion uh, around uh, what's actually going to happen. I mean, we've we've had the letter from Paul Gray indicating that the board will not be required to effectively repay their debt until it is in financial balance. What is your understanding of the, the phrase financial <coughs> balance? And secondly, given the time frame that will be required to reach what I suspect they mean by financial balance, you know, that, that debt will become, you know, quite a challenge, I would have thought. <laughs> for the board to repay, would they not just be better everybody recognising that, you know, particularly if we're going to make sure that um, services are not going to decline significantly in Tayside, that we should just write off this debt and allow them to, to make a fresh start? As I understand it, um, as you say, the Chief Executive of the Health Service has um, made the commitment that NHS Tayside won't be required to repay it until the board is back in financial balance and that a decision will be taken at that point about whether it needs to be repaid or not. Um, financial balance means meeting the resource limits, both revenue and capital, which are set for NHS Tayside as for every board. Um, and the board itself identifies that in order to be financially sustainable, it will need to make savings of £205.8 million cumulatively over the next five years. Um, there's little doubt, I think, that the outstanding brokerage of £33.2 million at the moment will increase further by a small amount, um, and Fiona will be able to give you updated um, indications of that if that would be useful. I think it is a policy matter for government to decide whether um, it um, wants to write off the debt or to suspend it as it has done um, until the board's back in balance. But as my report says, there, there's no doubt it will be challenging for the board to return to financial balance. And, and how achievable is £200 million of savings over the next five years, particularly if there is to be no reduction in fact, one would be arguing that there should be anything but. There should be an enhancement of service provision. And, and if you look at all the, the government strategies and so on, there'll certainly be further demands on resource allocation within Tayside uh, to, to meet national targets and so on. So what are the realistic prospects of achieving a further cumulative £200 million worth of savings? 
I think that's the key question. Um, the committee knows from previous work um, that we've done, that Tayside itself has done, and that the Assurance Group has done, um, that Tayside um, costs more relative to other boards to deliver like-for-like -like services. When you were take, taking account of its population and so on, it's still costing more. Um, the Assurance Group has said that the areas that the Transformation Plan is working on are the right ones to address that, that higher cost. They're looking at the big areas like costs of workforce, realistic medicine, costs of prescribing, all the areas where Tayside is more expensive for the same um, level of service. And there's no doubt that it will be challenging to do it. Um, in some ways, I think Tayside is facing a, a more acute um, version of the problems facing the health service as a whole um, and understanding how the change can be made, what it costs to do that, what the impacts are on staff and patients and other public bodies is a key part of what needs to happen in Tayside over the next few years. Fiona, do you want to add to that at all? Yes, yes. So, yes, it, it is the case that uh, it continues to face extremely challenging financial position and the challenges to, to make financial balance continue. In 2016-17, um, the board delivered significant efficiency savings of £45 million, and that was double what they'd achieved in the previous year. So that was significant, but it was still below the target that was needed. And, and as has already been mentioned, brokerage was received for that year. Um, in terms of the 2017-18 the financial position, the financial plans for the board showed that it needed nearly £50 million pounds of savings to, to um, achieve balance. Um, it was recognised that the board could not achieve that in one year and um, the local delivery plan includes a target for £45.8 million savings with around about £4 million to be met from brokerage this year. So there's further brokerage to be um, achieved. The latest outturn position that is being reported by the board is that the shortfall in efficiency savings is in the region of £5 million, but the board is taking extra actions um, to, to draw that in uh, to the £4 million that was included in the local delivery plan. The board very much recognises that to achieve financial balance into the future, it's not enough to just keep making efficiency savings and that for more fundamental service redesign and transformational changes required. And that is the objective of the transformation programme that is now in place and underway in, in the board. But it's yet to deliver on those, those savings, the level of savings. Um, and, and we'll start to hopefully see the impact of some of the initiatives that are coming through through that programme uh, into the, the longer term. Um, so um, ultimately where we are at this point in time, based on the evidence, it's that, that there's a high risk that the financial plan 2017-18 won't be achieved, um, but it's something that we'll continue to monitor and report on through the audit. I think it'd be useful if we could get a copy of the actual <coughs> transformation plan they're working to, if that is possible. <coughs> I think it is possible. I think it may have been provided um, previously when the uh, committee was taking evidence from NHS Tayside, but we can work with the clerks to confirm that. The final question is, who is making sure that these savings are not being made at the expense of the patients? Um, that's... Obviously, mainly the responsibility of the board, the chair and the chief executive, and I know in assurances they've given to this committee, they take that very seriously. Um, the role of the um, advisory and assurance group is absolutely to test that and to make sure that um, the effect on patients is being uh, planned, measured, and that any adverse um, effects are being dealt with as quickly as possible. That's one of the reasons why the government put the group in place. And, and from your report, I mean, of the eight targets, that, you know, three, I think, have improved, so four have remained the same, and a couple have gone down the way, or uh, something of that order. So uh, would you say at the moment there is no indication that this is leading to a reduction in the quality of service? But presumably that's something you're going to keep a close eye on in terms of these performance targets. 
We say in paragraph 18 of the report, exactly as you said, that um, eight were not met, eight were met or exceeded, yes, and sorry. that Tayside is by no means an outlier compared to other boards. Um, but we take seriously the need to look at their financial performance in the context of their performance overall and the safety of patients, and we'll continue to keep an eye on that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, okay. Fiona, did I cut you off there? Uh, no, just really to pick up on, on what you said there, if we come compare the performance from year to year, there is no clear picture about whether a performance is improving or declining. Four have improved, eight have declined, three are the same, and there are two for, for which no targets are, uh, are available. So it's very much a mixed picture and, and there's, there's no clear um, direction of travel can be taken from those indicators at the moment. Thank you. Okay, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, just to be a little bit nitpicking, What's the definition of net expenditure for NHS uh, Tayside? You say 892 million. So if there's a net expenditure, it must be a gross expenditure. What's the... Um, <coughs> that's the net expenditure that comes from the uh, annual accounts um, that are published and, and audited by us. So that's the, the bottom line figure, uh, which is the net position of, of income less expenditure. So does that take into account any income? Is there any yes, income it does. There? Yes. How much income? Um, I would need to look at the accounts on that, Bruce. <laughs> I'll I, I tell you what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, in knowing what the, the gross expenditure is and seeing what the savings against gross expenditure are because it you know, would be interesting to see how much income they actually have. It, it's not that simple to take out of the accounts because the accounts show uh, income and expenditure over different um, uh, natures of cost, so that's not a figure that we can easily provide. The £205.8 million, which has to be saved over the next five years, that's an addition to the 2016-17 figure of 45.5, is isn't it? Yes. I, mean, I, I would echo what uh, Alec Neil is saying. Is that possible <coughs> on that level of budget? Um, it, it is challenging. We, we, we don't think it's impossible, and the um, advisor and assurance group don't think it's impossible. It might be worth looking at the um, savings forecast for the next five years, which is set out in Exhibit 3. Um, what they're showing is that the percentage um, of the baseline funding that needs to be made in savings is declining over that period. For reference, in 2016-17, the year that this report was about, um, the savings achieved were 6.5%, and they're reducing down steadily to about 5%. We do know, as we've said, that the... Um, the costs in H NHS Tayside are higher than in other boards for like for like service, so there is scope to make savings, but it's a very significant amount to be taking out, and it can only safely be done by transforming services, which is what the board is trying to do. That's why we highlight the risks to achieving them. Has anyone actually looked at? I mean, uh, it's quoted here about uh, you know workforce costs, pres prescribing costs, clinical supplies. Has anyone looked at it and said whether that's appropriate spend? for Tayside, given its demography and all the other things that come into this? In other words, is it actually not excessive, given what they're trying to deal with? No, when I, when I talk about like-for-like um, like spend, it's taking account of exactly those sorts of things. It's taking account of the demographic the size of the population, the demographic makeup, um, the extent to which there may be particular challenges for delivering because of rurality and so on. Um, and as far as it's possible to make comparisons on a like-for-like like basis, they suggest that Tayside is still more expensive than other boards, largely for historical reasons due to the number of large hospital sites that they've been operating with over that period and the um, referral and treatment patterns that, that have um, historically been seen in Tayside. So, it, it, again, it reinforces that point that it's possible, but it's not easy, and it just rely on transforming services. Now, previously, when this first came up, uh, a large part of the uh, projected savings revolved around disposal of fixed assets. Um, and I know some fixed assets have been disposed of, and I see that they've reduced the anticipation of what they'll get from that source. What's the cost to NHS Tayside of maintaining these fixed assets that they're waiting to dispose of? 
that's something that, that I don't have to hand, but, but clearly there will be a cost of the ongoing maintenance um, while, while the board is waiting to dispose of this, these assets. It's something that's recognised by the board and they are taking action to dispose of surplus assets and they monitor and report back on progress to the board on a regular basis on that. Is it possible for us to know how much that those maintenance costs are? Because I think previously they were significant, but... That's not, not something we would be aware of part of this work, but um, you'd need to ask the board about that. The history of this with NHS Tayside has not been an easy one, and there have been failures in terms of management and the board over the years. Um, are we satisfied that currently the governance and management uh, of NHS Tayside is adequate to the task ahead of them? Um, I mentioned in my introductory remarks that this is the third report I've produced on Tayside in consecutive years. I think the real difference this year is that there is that not just a recognition of the problem, which we saw last year, but a much fuller understanding of it and of what's needed to address it um, than um, was initially the case. Um, I think you may be the only member of the committee who was in, in, on the committee at, at that time round. What initially triggered my reporting on NHS Tayside was um, the fact that there annual accounts contained over-optimistic assumptions about the proceeds of the disposal of assets in the following year, which um, had the effect of appearing to minimise the scale of the financial challenge they were facing. I think we've moved beyond a situation where the focus was on how to minimise the problem to a situation where actually it's, it's now much clearer what the problem is and the plans for addressing it are developing all the time. As we say in the report, the challenge now is to turn those plans into action and to do it in a way that does take patients and the people of Tayside with the board to reach a situation that's not just sustainable in future, but potentially providing better health care than it's been able to so far. Has there been much change in the composition of the board itself and in the management of NHS Tayside? Um, since the initial problems came to light, we have seen the appointment of a new chief exec and some turnover among board members, um, and I think that's contributed towards that um, recognition of and grasping of the problem that I've just described. Fiona, do you want to add to that? Um, yes, the, the director of finance um, has now been in place for about a year, the current director of finance, so that, that has been a change in, in the management team. And certainly our evidence of, of working at, at the board, we see a clear commitment from that senior executive team to the, the level of change that is required. Um, and, um, is the chief executive an internal promotion or is it someone who's come in from outside? It was an internal promotion, and that's something I think that the committee explored in its, its previous evidence mm. sessions with the board. Mm. But the board itself is essentially the same board that was overseeing the situation over the last few years. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to mislead the committee by focusing on specific um, terms of appointment. There has been turnover, and I think the chair is a, a new chair since the problems built up um, before my first report. Bruce, can you shine any light on that? We've only taken on the audit for this year, so I'm not really sure about the composition of it before then, so I don't think I could add anything to that. I guess my concern is to ensure that uh, you know, those who failed previously are not building us up for failure in the future and that there's people in there who actually understand the issue, have their hands around it and are managing it efficiently and successfully. I, I recognise that concern. It's obviously one I'm aware of in, in reaching my audit conclusions in the report you have before you. Um, and I think the, the board and the senior management team now have a full understanding of the issue and a commitment to resolving it. Um, the challenge of doing so is the next step. I think the staging report that was done by the transformation support team, uh, you can get some comfort from the commitment of the of the executive team uh, at NHS Tayside, uh, and I think the support of the trans uh, transformation support team will be crucial in terms of uh, providing the sort of advice that they're able to give to make sure that they get to a, a balanced position in the, in the coming years. Supplementary from Liam Kerr. Very briefly, just to clarify something, uh, you, you said in response to Colin Beattie that the Director of Finance had only been there for about a year. I have in my mind that the Director of Finance had been there for about 33 years. So what, what have I missed? No, he has worked at the board for a longer period of time, but in that post as, as Director, just for over a, a year. But it is years, the same so chap that's been there for 33 years, isn't it? Yes, I don't you. know ex the exact term, but I guess. 
Okay, Willie so Coffey. Oh. The, the point you asked about the, uh, the level of income, um, I've had an opportunity to look at the accounts and that's off the order of about 600 million. So that was the, um, that's what brought the net expenditure down to just over 800 million. Okay, right, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to ask a follow up to that. Willie Coffey. I wonder, I wasn't part of the previous discussion on this issue with the NHS Tayside, but could you just uh, elaborate a wee bit about what the differences are in Tayside that might be giving rise to some of these cost pressures? What's different or special about Tayside? Um, we know that their level of staffing costs um, relative to the population they serve and activity is higher than um, the average for boards across Scotland. <laughs> Um, we know that their prescribing costs, um, both in hospital and I think in primary care, are higher. Um, and I think that's due to both higher numbers of prescriptions um, and higher costs of prescriptions around there. And we know that their estates and property costs are higher than um, the average for NHS boards across around Scotland. Um, they have a lot of analysis as to um, why that is and where the costs are arising, um, but they're higher in those three key areas. Bruce, are you wanting to add to that? Um, no, I don't think. I think that's, that's very common. Yeah, but, I mean, what I'm interested in, why are they higher? I mean, pres prescribing costs went up um, by an extra £2 million. Pounds in your paragraph 14, or the general said, prescribing costs overspent by £6.7 million compared to an overspend of £4.7 million the previous year. So in one year, prescribing costs went up another £2 million. What on earth could the, the reason for that be? Um, they're not alone in that. Um, their overall prescribing costs are higher than, than Scotland as a whole. Um, but as we were saying in the earlier session, drug costs nationally, UK-wide, are rising faster than inflation. Part of that is straightforward inflation in the cost of drugs. Part of it is new drugs becoming available that tend to be very expensive. And part of it is an ageing population where more people are getting prescriptions. So they're not alone in it, in it moving in that way. They are unusual in that the, the sort of baseline is, is higher for Tayside than for other boards, and that's having an impact on their overall financial position. Um, the board has commissioned um, some very detailed um, exploration of where those higher costs are arising, how much it's volume and how much it's price, and whether it's hospital prescribing, GP prescribing, which specialties it, it's happening in, to let them really drill down and address it. So again, in terms of getting their arms around the problem, that they have a much better understanding now, but their starting point is higher than other health boards across Scotland. But there's good evidence that they're taking that on board and they're tackling, what, tackling that directly now. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Okay, Monica Lennon. Um, thank you, convener. I was just looking actually at the the performance figures at the, at the back and something from the previous session stuck in my mind. The section on uh, psychological therapy, and I see there's, there's been a number of vacancies and um, maternity leave care breaks and so on. Is that an area where it's possible that um, posts are, are not being filled del deliberately? Because um, that is quite concerning, looking at the the drop in standard there? I don't think we can answer that specific question. We do know that, that um, psychiatry is one of the specialties that can be hard to recruit to across Scotland. So, um, that, again, they're not alone in that. Fiona, is there anything that you want to add to it based on your local knowledge? Um, no specifics, um, though um, where the board is struggling on issues of, of recruitment, they're looking at their attraction and um, retention policies across the board as part of their, their workforce planning um, through the transformation programme, but no specifics on that that I could Thank add. you. Thank you. Um, in terms of NHS Tayside, I mean, I've been in a number of these sessions now and, and it's been a very challenging picture. I'm wondering um, what are the wider lessons that have been taken from Tayside? Um, it's not escaped her attention that the, the health secretary herself um, is local to Tayside. Um, so how can we be reassured that the challenges that Tayside have faced are, are not going to start to creep into to other boards? Um, I have, as well as the report you have in front of you and Fiona's very close engagement with NHS Tayside, um, I've um, tried to stay, to keep a close eye on what the government is doing to manage the situation, to support the board, um, to protect the interests of patients and people across Scotland. Um, I genuinely think the approach of having 
the advisory and assurance group to um, test their thinking and, and challenge it um, and to do that robustly but in a way that, that's constructive and the transformation um, support team which is helping them to draw on expertise elsewhere in Scotland is a very positive model for dealing with a problem of this scale. And I think that um, senior people within the Scottish Government are taking the opportunity to think about how elements of that approach can be applied elsewhere. So to really use the benchmarking to understand where costs are higher or where performance is lower than elsewhere, to use that as a way of sharing um, good practice, sharing expertise, tapping into new ways of doing things, um, to help peers learn from each other across Scotland. I think there's a, there's a good start been made on that. I think there's scope to take it further. And I think it can also be used to inform some of the things we were describing earlier around better workforce planning and better capital investment planning. Um, so again, although this is um, a, a very difficult situation in Tayside, I think there is an opportunity uh, to learn from it for other parts of Scotland and to use it as one of the levers for encouraging people to adopt good practice um, where it's developed elsewhere. Okay. The Assurance and Advisory Group um, you know, basically looking at the report recommendations, there are some, you know, points of concern there. And one of the things you highlight in your report is that the the group reports there's insufficient evidence of progress with the key elements of the transformation programme. So there's still a lack of confidence that Tayside can achieve its financial plan. You know, there's a few warning signs in here and, and we've heard a lot of uh, optimism from, from the board, from some of the witnesses before, so how can we be sure that things really are on track? Um, I think I think what you've got is um, my assurance, which draws on the um, views of the advisory and assurance group um, about the balance between absolutely the scale of the challenge and the progress that's being made. Um, I hope we've been able to give you a, a sort of a thorough and balanced view of that. Um, the uh, assurance group um, genuinely, I think, feels that a lot of progress has been made in understanding the problem and drawing up plans, and they're very clear that the next stage of implementing those plans is going to be the key one. We all know that's not going to be easy. It means taking a wide range of staff right across Tayside um, with the, the board and the management team to do it. Um, it will mean some changes to services for patients, some of which may in the longer term be better than what's currently provided, but change is always uncomfortable. And there are cost pressures pulling in the other direction around drug costs, as we've described, around um, pressures on the property market where disposals are part of the plan. So progress is being made, the problem is understood better, and there's a much stronger commitment to what needs to happen to address it, but it's not plain sailing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still quite a lot of unknowns there. Just my final question is, you know, the board is expecting um, the percentage of recurring savings to increase to 60%, so it's quite a, a big number from 19 to 20 onwards. Um, are you satisfied that that is achievable? I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that the recurring savings are going up at the expense of non-recurring savings. Recurring savings are um, an indication that they're genuinely managing to reshape services in ways that um, can be sustained for the longer term, whereas non-recurring savings are often made by um, selling properties or not filling vacancies. I think it's a good sign the challenge is whether they can achieve it and maintain the quality of care at the same time. Sorry, there is some evidence about the percentages of recurring savings on a positive trend. In 1516, only 35 per cent were recurring savings. In 1617, it was nearer to 50 per cent. Um, and so that's a, a positive um, direction with that, with that from the board. And are you happy that there's no detriment to, to patients? As we... As we yeah. Um, well, as we, we said earlier, based on the uh, indicators at, at Appendix 1, it's a very mixed picture and there's no clear uh, evidence either way of a, an improvement or a decline in, in performance over certainly the, the last year. And that's something we'll need to monitor going forward. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'll try and be brief. There's a number of matters arising, uh, it seems to me. They, they, first of all, there's been a great deal of non-financial support given to NHS Tayside over a considerable period of time. Uh, other than providing brokerage and reviewing the NRAC allocations, are there any other feasible ways that the Scottish Government can actually be assisting the board? Uh, are there any other 
non-financial things that they should be doing? Are there any other financial things they should be doing? Um, I think for very understandable reasons, the focus of the Scottish Government has been on helping the board to understand the problems and to address the underlying causes of it, rather than to continue providing short-term funding to, to close the gap. Um, I've said previously in response to um, questions that I think um, the approach of having both the transformation support team, which is there to provide support and advice, and the slightly arm's length assurance group, which is there to test out and challenge progress, is a good model um, and one that could be adapted and used elsewhere. Um, if I had any um, criticism of the approach that's been taken so far, I think the um, the focus on one-year brokerage to fill a gap this year rather than a longer-term view of what the financial situation is and what's needed to address that took a while to, to put in place. Um, I've been reporting since 2013 when I took this job that we need a longer-term approach to um, financial planning, financial management, um, and I think this is a good example where a, a real over-focus on the annual situation made it harder to get a grip on the longer-term position and really start to address it. Yeah, I'll come back to the financial piece and the, and the financial management in a second. Uh, can you tell me, just, uh, has there been a significant cost, by which I also mean an opportunity cost, to the Scottish Government and other parts of the NHS as a result of providing this extensive support to NHS Tayside? And specifically the thing I have in my mind is, I, I, I recall, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that NHS Grampian... Uh, needed about 15 million to get it up to its NRAC, uh, or the, the, the funding formula required to be met would require an extra 50 million to go to NHS Grampian. Is there any suggestion, any possibility that money is being pulled from other parts of the estate to support NHS Tayside? In, in the sort of micro picture, not. I think if you look at the amounts of brokerage each year as set out in Exhibit 2, they're very small in the context either of um, Tayside's overall funding or the 13 billion or so that's spent on the NHS overall. Um, I think the, the bigger opportunity cost is the one that we were describing earlier, that NHS Tayside costs more on average to provide similar services than other boards. Um, and tackling those sorts of differences will free up resources that can be invested right across the country. It has taken government longer than it initially expected to get all of the boards to their NRAC position, the National Resource Allocation Committee formula, um, but I don't think Tayside itself was a significant element in that. And is there a suggestion then that NHS Tayside will require permanent additional support, whether it be financial or more likely permanent uh, like support from the AEG, for example? The intention is not. Um, Mr Neil asked um, an early question about what financial sustainability means. It means being able to manage within the resources that are available to it under the national funding system and provide the level and quality of services that the people of Tayside need within that money. Getting to that position is the challenge. Uh, and just staying finally on the financial position. So we heard uh, Fiona Mitchell Knight earlier on talked about the deficit forecast of four million uh, for 2017-18, and that there will be additional brokerage required. The AAG, the uh, Assurance and Advisory Group, <clears throat> believes that that is an underestimate. Uh, you said earlier on, Auditor General, that. Uh, <laughs> Previous financial estimates had been over-optimistic about the disposals, and now there's a recognition after, I think you said, four years of reporting on this, that there's a need for longer-term financial management. Doesn't that concern you at all, that whoever is responsible for this situation apparently is still underestimating the size of the hole uh, and is still in a position to be trying to fix a problem which some might suggest, had been caused by those who are currently on watch. Um, I, I'll ask Fiona in a moment to um, give you the latest financial position as, as we understand it. Um, I, um, I think we've touched previously on the extent to which there is 
um, a new board and changes in the senior team at Tayside, um, which has got a, a fuller understanding and a very strong commitment to dealing with what needs to be done here. Um, and I think there is um, genuine complexity in trying to um, make changes on the scale that are required in Tayside. That's not to say that I don't think there is a risk of optimism bias in anything of this nature, partly because of the commitment people have got to, to fixing it. Um, and I think that's the value of having the assurance and advisory group there to be applying that, that very detailed um, examination and challenge to the plans that they've got. Fiona, do you want to just provide a quick update on the current position this year? Yes, the current forecast out term position for March 18 is currently that there's a savings gap of £5 million compared to the £4 million, um, but, but the board is working on measures to, to close that gap and, and is anticipating being able to do that, but we'll obviously have to wait and see. Yeah. Commitment to dealing with it? Yes. You know this organisation better than anyone having looked at it. Do you think they will deal with it? As you say, there's definitely a commitment to do so, um, but the important thing is the shift away from short-term efficiency savings to, to real service design and transformational change. And the actions that, is, that the board is taking through the transformation programme are driving that forward. Um, we're starting to see some initiatives coming through. So um, at the board meeting in December, um, the board is due to discuss the overarching clinical strategy, which will set the direction for the board going forward and then the workforce plans will be aligned to that clinical strategy. So there are some real important uh, milestones coming up for the board and we can see them in, in the near future but it, they're yet to deliver financial savings that are reported in, in the accounts to date and that will be something that we'll be looking for in the future. But will they deliver in your view? We say in both of our reports it's challenging. I can't give you a guarantee it's challenging. Thank you. Okay, Bill Bowman. Um, thank you, convener. Um, again, I think Colin Beatty and others have touched on topics that I was going to to speak about, and you know, I don't have the detailed experience of um, this board that others do. But just looking at the history over the past what five years, where an organisation has effectively had to go to its banker and ask for for more money, and then keep on refinancing it. And then, not unusually, the, the banker or the lender has put in its own team to try and see what's going on and oversee it. And not only that, has put in another team to actually see that its recommendations are um, you know, worked through. It is, of course, worrying. The discussion around it has um, spoke about they recognise, they have yet to deliver. Um, it hasn't really, and I, I suppose Liam has... Liam, Kerr has asked the question about will they do it. When um, you, Fiona, were, were finalising your, your audit, I presume um, you, know, you were concerned about the future viability of the organisation and you would go to the, to the government as a lender to get some comfort that they would um, continue with the, uh, the existing funds and you know, future ones. And you would speak about the, the, the future plans. I mean, the key thing, I think, is uh, not just the recognition and yet to deliver, it's the competence of the management. Did the Scottish Government have a view on the competence of the management? Um, the Scottish Government certainly haven't spoken to me about the, the competency of, of the management. In terms of um, the work of the Assurance and Advisory Board, they have reported um, the same level of commitment that, that I've spoken about from, from those senior executives. Um, but what they've recognised was um, the capacity of the executive team was under stretch because of the, the scale of change required. And that's why the transformation support team was brought in to work alongside the executive team to support them in that. Um, but there's been no indication of capability issues with that senior executive team. And would you not expect there to be a discussion like that? Um, how can you be satisfied that the future plans will work if you don't know how competent the, the management are? Um, I think Fiona's taking um, 
comfort from her own experience of the team and the views of the assurance and advisory group which are there. Um, there is also an important difference in public services compared to the corporate sector um, in that the government can continue to fund at the level that's required as they have done at the past. So the assurance that they will continue to do that carries more weight than um, the uh, uh, the need to take a view on the competence of the management team. Having said that, I, I share Fiona's view that there isn't a... Um, the main question here isn't the competence of the team, it's the scale of the challenge and the scale of the change that's required in a system as complex as healthcare. I'm slightly like concerned about the, um, the issue that Liam uncovered there, that you know, we're talking about a new finance director when in fact it's somebody who's been there for a long time and is presumably carrying on as before. Uh, he's certainly been in the board for, for some time, um, but has obviously um, been promoted into the director of, of finance post um, more recently, um, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, in terms of the financial management of the board, overall our annual audit report um, reports that, that that's effective in terms of the processes that were in place, but clearly the, the size of, of the challenge in meeting the financial um, forecasts of the future is something that, that they're working on through the transformation programme. Okay, I think I'll leave it there as the competence okay. situation is as it is. Perfect timing. Can I thank the witnesses um, for their evidence this morning? The committee is now going to go into private session and I propose a three-minute break. Sure. Thank you.